Y'all know what's going on. It's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. Look here, y'all. I've been to a lot of prisons in Tennessee. I've been to a lot of prisons all over the state. And my experiences are vast and wide. I've done a lot of things. Those of you that have been following me uh, for a while now, even those of you that are recent, I appreciate you continue to do so. Share the podcast with your family and friends. And look, I always hit that like button for me. I always hit that like button and let me know that you like the show. Leave comments too, right? You know, it helps me build the type of shows that you want to hear on the on, on the our podcast. So I always do that. But anyway, let me get back to the point I'm trying to make. Um, like I said, I've been to a lot of prisons all over the state. And when I tell my stories, I say this happened at such and such prison and I'll change the name, this name, the third, right? I want to get away from that. What I'm going to start doing now is all of my stories are going to be based on this fictional prison that I came up with, but it's really based on the factual events of every prison. Instead of bouncing from prison to prison, all of my stories are going to be coming from this place called Crockett Correctional. Now, I came up with the name Crockett Correctional of no special reason, anything like that. I was just sitting there and thinking, how do I tell my stories and give people a more realistic outlook on how things go in prison from day to day. And I got to thinking about the show called Oz and the Orange is the New Black, which I've never seen that before, but I've heard about it. But Oz I had seen in the past, and I wanted it to be based on this one location, even though I've been to several locations. So the location that I'm going to be coming from now with my personal stories and the stories that I've been told about or whatever are going to be coming from this place that I've created called Crockett Correctional. And at Crockett Correctional, it's like any other prison, state prison. You have a warden, and at this particular prison, we're going to call the warden. His name is going to be Warden Fleming. And I'm adding Warden Fleming to the story because when it's important and necessary, I'm going to be adding what the warden would do in the situations that occur and how he would respond or she would respond for that matter. You know, to a situation. And we got we got another warden. He's a warden over security. We're going to call him Warden Lemons. And we got another warden that's a warden of treatment and rehabilitation. We're going to call her Warden Rodriguez. And you also have internal affairs at, at all facilities. And at this particular facility, uh, we're going to call the internal affairs. His name is going to be uh, Sergeant Malone. And we got STGs. That's a security threat group. That's about gangs and all that kind of stuff. We're going to call her Miss Simpson. And you also have what they call tactical teams, people that are basically the tip of the spear that when you have problems on the compound, they go out, right? And this is going to be called a four squad. And they're going to be responsible for all of the, you know, trying to maintain order for the warden at any particular institution. But at Crockett facility, at Crockett Correctional Facility, this is going to be called the four squad. Now, the prison that I'm going to give you, in, in as far as the backdrop, is 1,500 inmates at this facility. And the mission of Crockett is to provide medical and mental health services to the state's prison population. So you're going to always have people coming in and out from Crockett. Because if they get sick or they need to see the dentist or they got mental health issues or something traumatic has happened to them at another prison, they had a mental breakdown for whatever reason, they are going to get sent to Crockett. That's what it's about. And the main areas of drama at Crockett, any area is an area of drama in prison. And at Crockett, it's especially true. It's the child hall, the gym, the units that the guys live in, the hospital, the mental health units, the whole, all over. And you get all types of gangs. Bloods, Crip, Vice Lord, uh, 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 gangsters, uh, Aryan Brotherhood, all kinds of different types of organizations. And you got to be weary about your interactions. You got to watch all of that. You got to pay attention, right? But today, at Crockett, I want to tell you this story about this young gang member, young Crip. His name is Taylor. And see, Taylor didn't have a lot of time. He had a nine-year sentence, right? Nine-year sentence. He got caught with some dope. You know how it go. 
you know? And when Taylor got caught with this dope, he got sent to prison. And while he's been serving his time, you know, he's one of those guys, he wants to enjoy his sentence the best he can. So he goes from day to day, smoking weed, getting high. But see, Taylor had a liking for X pills. You know, X pills, that's not something that I've ever dealt with, never dealt with at all, right? And a lot of the guys that I associate with, you know, they would always tell me about these ex peers and what they would do. And mainly, most of the guys that I told, they said it was a drug that would enhance your mood, whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. If you were down and you took it when you were down, you were going to be sad, sad. But if you were up when you took it, you're going to be super duper happy. But a lot of guys, from what I understand, they took it to enhance their, uh, let's say, sex drive. Okay? Now, I don't know why anybody in their right mind would want to take that kind of drug in a prison surrounded by nothing but men. Now, of course, yeah, you have women that work at the facility and all this and that, but hey, those things do happen, but everybody don't get those opportunities. You feel what I'm saying? Everybody don't get those opportunities. So for the most part, why would you even take something like that? But Taylor, he was a different beast. He was into that. And he got high, like I say, he liked to smoke weed and do other things too. You know, and at this particular time, you know, that ghost smoke, and if you've heard any of the episodes in my season three of Undercover Gangster, if you haven't, go to my membership page, because it's going to be coming out, season three is going to be coming in August, season two is up now, so go to my membership page and you can catch up on season two, go to my regular page and you can listen to season one for free, and then you can catch yourself up, and then in August, make sure you join that membership page, because season three is going to drop, but anyway, that ghost smoke, that's that new dope, it's that new dope, y'all. That, that ghost smoke is, is, is what that, that, that bug spray. They spray it on that, on that paper and burn it and inhale it. They say it's worse than crack. And you got to use it every 15 minutes. So he's experimenting with that too, right? But Cuz and them, the little organization that he's a part of, you know, they got locks on that right now. They got locks on that at Crockett. And they distribute it out to different individuals, right? And one of the main individuals that they distribute it to to kind of get locks on is a clerk. This is a dude. He's a clerk for the, one of the units. You know, at all the units, you know what I'm saying, at Crockett, you have what you call unit managers or unit directors, and they run those buildings. And up under them, you have a clerk, it's usually an inmate, that does a lot of the paperwork and runs errands for them and all of these types of things, right? So the gang members at Crockett, they make sure that they have a clerk in their pocket so that they can make sure that things get moved around for them. You know what I mean? So this particular clerk at Crockett, he was addicted to that ghost smoke. Bad. Bad. But he couldn't pay his bills like he's supposed to. So they used him for favors. Some of them used him for those types of favors that I don't really want to be talking about. You know what I'm saying? Because it didn't interfere with my monetization. But you know what I'm talking about. So use your imagination. Now here's the thing. Now Taylor, like I told you, he liked them x pills, okay? So one day, the clerk Happened to, be, happened to be doing some rounds, passing out paperwork that needs to be passed out, this, that, and the third. And see, a lot of people think that they're really paying attention to their surroundings and watching everything that's going on in here, but they're really not. Because you can't account for people that you can't see. So you can look out your window, and you don't see anybody, and then you run back inside the cell a little further to wherever you were trying to do whatever it is you were trying to do, and in your mind you're thinking, well, nobody's in the hall, so I can go back over here and lean on the bed and do what I want to do. But the problem with that is, the second you walk off of the door, you're not looking in the hallway, and somebody could have come in the hallway from the time you walked away from the door to the time you got from back to the bed. And when you get back to the bed, they're on your door, they're looking in. So, And that's what happened to Taylor. See, Taylor, he had him an x pill. But see, what I was told, listen to me. See, a lot of people, a lot of people, they don't eat those x pills. They don't eat them. Oh, yeah, you want to know what they do with them? Now, see, some of y'all probably already know what to do with them. I don't. I ain't got no experience with those things. None at all. But see, what Taylor does, Taylor puts that x pill in his rectum. Oh, yep, yeah, I said it. Yeah. He puts it up in his rectum. Why in the world would he do that? Well, what I was told, because I don't have any experience in it, I'm telling you now, 
But I know some of y'all do out there. I know some of y'all do. You're probably laughing right now knowing what I'm going to get to. But here's the thing. When a person, from what I was told, puts that X pill in their rectum, it absorbs into the system faster, causing them to get higher faster and stay higher longer. I don't know how that works. I don't even know how they would have even discovered that it works like that. How do you figure something like that out? You understand what I'm saying? But anyway, see, Taylor had walked off of that door. And when he got back over by the bunk and the toilet, he was in the, he had his pants down. He had on sweatpants at the time, for what I was told. And he had his hand behind his back. Now, here come the clerk. The clerk had just walked up and was sliding some paper through the crack of the door. That's how they do. They slide it inside of your door and leave it hanging so you can just pull it in to yourself. So right about the time Taylor was had his hand behind his back, mm, you know what I'm talking about, here come the clerk. And he, the clerk looked in. He said, oh, excuse me. Now, you know, the clerk got a little tutor fruit in him. You know what I'm talking about. You know, but to each his own. And I really mean that, to each his own. So he does his thing. And the clerk sees it, but he keeps it moving. Now, let's be real. There's no way that the clerk would really know what it is that Taylor was up to. He could have been wiping his butt. He could have been scratching his butt. Who knows what he was doing? Don't nobody really know. But because Taylor knew what he was doing, he became paranoid that the clerk wouldn't have known what he was doing. He came, became paranoid, and it spooked him. It spooked him. So now he's worried that the clerk is going to be spreading his business around. But it's no way that the clerk would have seen the pill. You know? Or would he? But see, a part of that story came to light later on as to why Taylor was really spooked, see? Because he had gotten the pill from the clerk. Mm. So now... It's better understood, for me anyway, why Taylor was suspicious that the clerk would know what he was doing. See, he had been talking with this clerk. He had been kicking it with this clerk. And it came out that him and the clerk were a little bit too comfortable with one another. So when the clerk seen that and he went on about his business, now Taylor's nervous that the clerk is going to say something to somebody. It's one thing to be cool with somebody and you might talk about what you do, but when they see you actually do it, especially something like that in the penitentiary, that's leverage. Now, remember, I always told y'all, people in here always have an agenda. They always have an agenda. So if they see something that they can use to give favor or put leverage over somebody, trust me and believe this. They're going to remember it and they're going to use it when it's necessary, especially against a gang member. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So, the conversation comes up one day with Cuz, Taylor, and some of his homeboys, right? About what to do about this clerk. You know, because the clerk is getting too involved in everybody's business, and he got debts to pay. He got serious debts to pay. He ain't paying his debts because he always thinking that, you know, he can put it off. They need him, and they don't want to really run him off, so they're going to always work with him. But Cuz never got him tired, right? He about four, 500 in on his debt dealing with this ghost smoke. And don't nobody have no time to be letting that kind of money be up in the air. You never know what's going to happen. You might get shipped. The clerk might get shipped. Anything can happen. And you want your money. So they let him ride long enough. So they told Taylor, they said, look, we need you to do something. We need you to do something for us. You know, the, the clerk wants to get a little piece of this ghost smoke. So they told him, said, look, get his to him. But see what they had done. See, that ghost smoke has got that raid on it, that bug spray. But see, they put a little extra dose on it, let it dry, and then they hit it again and let it dry. Now, I don't understand what that does, but they have it in their minds that this is going to put that extra mm on it, right? Just shake him up a little bit. So they give it to Taylor, and they tell Taylor to deliver it to the clerk, and he does. And the clerk gets it, and he tells me, he says, man, man, let, let your brothers and them know that they're going to get their money, man. I'm going to pay them. I'm going to make sure they get their money. And Taylor tells him, he said, everything cool and all this. Thing. But Taylor's looking at him. He got this look on his face that, you know, you better help me or I'll say something about you, you know. So Taylor said, Taylor went on and came with it. He said, man, uh, the other day when you came by the cell, he said, uh, what were you up to? He said, no, I was just passing out some paperwork and all this and that, right? He said, uh, then this is when the clerk said, don't, don't be worrying about it. I ain't got nothing to say about what you was doing. 
He said, I saw what you was doing, though. He said, you saw what I was doing? And the clerk said, yeah. He said, I had to make you feel. And Taylor, being the idiot that he is, and he's an idiot, y'all, I'm telling you now. This dude is a young idiot. He like, man, don't be saying nothing to nobody about it. The second he said that, he confirmed. He confirmed whether the clerk knew it or not that he was doing something he had no business, putting that X pill up his butt. So now, the the the, the crip dude is worried and nervous that the clerk is really gonna say something. The clerk tell him, "I got you, man. We're gonna help each other." He said, "Okay." So Taylor goes on about it being. He get back to the homeboys. He tell the homeboys, "Man, everything straight. He got it." So the clerk can't wait. He can't wait. He ain't got no patience. He can't wait to go up. He he get back to the room and the clerk, he lives in the four man cell. See, in the four man cell, you know what I'm saying, the cell's a little bit bigger and you always got somebody in your business. But, you know, depending on who you're in the cell with, after you've gotten a normal, all this and that, right? Most people that keep their mouth shut about your business won't say anything about what you got going on. You got your own little space. Take your charge if the police come in and everything will be fine. Even though most people don't take their charge, but that's just the understanding. You know what I'm saying? You never know if a person's going to keep it real until the heat comes. So in the meantime, between time, everybody plays real and solid. So the clerk is in the room. He got his battery. He got his little razor. You know, they, you take the batteries. You put the batteries side by side. They tape them together usually. And then, you know, on the top with a little part of the battery that's raised up, then they take the, the razor, right? You take a razor blade out of an actual razor and you put it on the top. And when you put it on the top, that razor is going to get hot because it's connected to that, the part of the battery that has the power that's coming out of you, if you understand what I'm saying, right? So when the battery gets, when the razor gets hot, then they put the paper on there and it burns the paper. And when it burns the paper, they inhale it just like that, the smoke from the paper. You know what I'm saying? It's a penitentiary pipe, y'all. Penitentiary pipe. Keep that thing moving. So now, the clerk, he's Gucci high. Now he got two of his sellers in there. The other sellers at work. He got two of his sellers in there. He leaned on back, you know what I'm saying, and trying to enjoy the high, right? Face all twisted up, eyes rolling in the back of his head. And when he lays back on his bunk, after a couple of minutes, right? And this high is like maybe a 15 minute high at the most. That's what they tell me anyway, because I don't get high, y'all. So anyway, he raised up. And when he raised up, imagine this picture in your mind, y'all. I need y'all to visualize this. He raises up and his hands is all crooked. His fingers is all crooked. Like a cat, you know how you make your hands and try to act like a cat, meow, meow, like you're gonna scratch? That's how his fingers were, they all bent up. But they were locked, and his face got locked up. And his cell is, because they have seen this before, we call it the gargoyle effect. You know what I'm saying? They look just like old gargoyle. You know how them gargoyles sit at the top of them old buildings in New York and all these different places? That's what they look like when they on that dope, right? So he set up, and his cell is recognized what he said, man, you straight? And he mouthed the best he could. He couldn't get the words all the way out of his mouth. But he said as best he could, he said, help me. Help me what are they doing to me what did they give me and about that time his settler his other settler looked at him and said man what's going on and by that time he threw up just like the exorcist vomit just came out of his mouth and he leaned forward it was like look here it was almost like you know he knew exactly how far to spit this vomit out of his mouth to hit the trash can because we got these small trash cans in the cells, right? So he leaned forward when he's throwing up. His hand's still locked in place like he just can't move like a gargoyle. And he throws up and he goes right into the toilet. I mean, right into the uh, trash can except for a little bit of it, right? And then he raises back up and tears are running down his eye. And it's almost like he's in this frozen state of mind that he can barely get the words out of his mouth. He's like, help me. So his seller said, do you want me to call the police? Because, you know, they're getting ready to count at this particular time during the lockdown. And if they call him up there, they're going to come and get him and get him to the nurse. So the clerk tells him, no, no, don't, don't call the police. Now, let me tell you something. This man don't know if he's going to die or not. But he's thinking like an addict. He's thinking to the next hit. If they come get me, take me to the hospital, take me to the hole, I'm not going to be able to get high later on. So he's willing to risk death. Listen to me. He's willing to risk death, hoping that this is going to pass. A couple of minutes go by, 
and now he's throwing up blood. He's still locked up in this frozen state, you know what I'm saying, like rigor, you know what I mean? Like I said, we call it the gargoyle effect. And he's throwing up in the in the, in the, in the uh, trash can, and now it's blood. Now, if he's throwing up blood, that means something on the inside is leaking, man. Something leaking. This dope done done something to his insides, and he's throwing up, and his cell is both of them not panicking because they don't know what to do because if somebody was to fall down and don't get up in the cell, you know what I'm talking about when I say fall down and don't get up. If they fall down and don't get up, now you're going to the whole pen and investigation, and you don't know how that's going to turn out because they want answers. And they're not going to play. They get real aggressive. They bring in the police from the street, investigators from the street, and they don't play them penitential games. They want know. They want answers. And if they connect you to anything, you finna wear that. You finna wear it. So now, he's throwing up blood into the trash can. And everybody's looking at it. The two dudes in the cell looking at it. His cell is looking at him like, man, what we going to do? And then dudes say real low. Real, like he forced the words out. Help me. Please help me. Now, they don't know what to do. What do they do with that? And if you want to find out what they do, you're going to have to come back and tune in to the next episode, right? I'm telling you, it's going to get better. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and welcome to the show, y'all. I'm getting so